So uh, my name is Dick Gross, and I have the pleasure of introducing the next plenary speaker, uh, James Arthur. So Jim uh, was, is now the university professor at uh, Toronto, the university where he was an undergraduate. Uh, he did his graduate work at Yale as a student of uh, Robert Langlands, and ha he's uh, since been a, a leader in the field of representation theory and automorphic forms for over 40 years. Uh, one of his great achievements, uh, accomplished over several decades, was a complete generalization of Selberg's famous trace formula from the group SL2 over the rational numbers to a general reductive group over an arbitrary number field, giving us uh, one of the most powerful tools available in the theory of automorphic forms. Jim also made a beautiful conjecture based on his work on the trace formula for the multiplicities of irreducible representations in the discrete spectrum, a conjecture which he has a program, an almost completed program for proving for classical groups. Uh, not only has he been a tremendous research contributor to mathematics, but he's also done a great deal of service to the community, in particular in an amazing effort at cross-border collaboration, he became president of the American Mathematical Society as a Canadian. I can't thank him enough for that. So I uh, look forward with great pleasure to his talk <clears throat> on uh, automorphic forms and L functions. Jim. Thank you, Dick. Am I mic'd? Can you hear me? Yes, all right, very good. Thank you, Dick, for your kind introduction. And I also uh, would like to thank the uh, IMU for giving me this opportunity to speak. It is a great honor, and I hope I can um, uh, live up to this honor. I, um, I hear some reverberation. I'll see if I can figure out how to talk in a way that quieter. Speak. Oh, the speaker's in my pocket, actually. So, uh, um, I suspect the main reason for me being asked to give this talk is that second reference there, the work that went into that, um, that uh, is, has now been published as a monograph, and I point out to everyone it's now available at a, a negligible cost. Um, but um, when um, the announcements for the plenary speakers became public, my colleagues came to me and they said, listen, this is your opportunity to make automorphic forms and the Langlands program understandable to a broader audience. We're counting on you. Okay, I said. Um, so what I am going to do is, uh, if I can manage my time well, I will spend the first two-thirds of the lecture with a general introduction to at least a part, sort of the classical part of the Langlands program, and I will uh, reserve the final third for a discussion of the work in that middle reference. Um, of course, as in all of these talks, we ha there's a, um, an article in the proceedings, which I think is out, and so there will be more details in that third reference, P. But for the first two-thirds of the talk, I will speak um, on the ideas that came in Lang Langland's seminal paper, that first paper up there, in which um, it's really an extraordinary paper. It's 45 years ago, and all of the main ideas uh, of the Lang what's become known as the Langlands program, base, uh, automorphic forms and L functions, um, were laid out. It, uh, rather, they weren't filled out, they, they um, uh, were added to over the years, but it's just an extraordinary paper. It, would, it actually followed a famous letter that Lang wrote to Andre Vey, uh, I think around 1965, laying out these ideas, and he modestly said at the end of the letter, perhaps um, being aware of Vey's fearsome reputation, uh, I hope these ideas might be of some interest to you. 
If they're not, please feel free, free to throw this letter in the garbage. Um, I don't think they did. Um, and um, so, so I will uh, then try to uh, discuss the ideas that are in this paper. Uh, <clears throat> all of the subjects that are being dis uh, lectured on in this Congress are, are difficult and deep. And when one um, gets, has the privilege to understand them, also very beautiful. Um, that's the wonder of mathematics. Um, automorphic forms has the additional um, constraint that it takes um, that it takes fundamental knowledge of several really very different parts of mathematics. And that is what perhaps is one of the main reasons why even 45 years after these ideas were laid out, they're still not uh, terribly well understood by, uh, even in a sort of superficial way, even knowing what their goals are um, by um, people outside the subject. Um, I think people that learn the subject basically learn to take a lot of the, they, you can't sort of learn all of these things in one, in one go, and people often, who, who are students who are learning the subject, try to take many of the subjects as a black box in which they just take th certain things for granted. And I think that's uh, sort of absolutely necessary. Uh, but let me, have some mo a little bit of motivation. Uh, the, the term the Langlands program did not become uh, common until about 20 or 25 years after uh, Langlands paper. Um, but it represents a conjectural way to characterize fundamental um, arithmetic data, data from the number theory world, in spectral terms. That is to say, terms involving spectrum, eigenvalues, completely different subject really a branch of analysis. So I'm t talking about automorphic forms and L functions. So automorphic forms, I'll, I'll say, I'll be more precise in a moment, but they are eigenforms, where you can really think of them as eigenfunctions, phi, um, of natural operators on certain Riemannian spaces, so-called arithmetic symmetric spaces. Riemannian manifolds were, I think, discussed in at least two of the plenary talks yesterday. Uh, the ones that are relevant here are a very particular brand, kind of Riemannian manifolds, manifolds that come from um, semi-simple Lie groups and have a great, a large number of symmetries. Um, L functions, uh, that's a subject that uh, I guess arose with uh, Riemann, uh, but um, it, uh, its broader aspects uh, um, originated purely in number theory, but what they represent in terms of automorphic forms are a way to package uh, these eigenvalues, these, these simultaneous eigenvalues. Uh, automorphic forms are um, um, uh, eigenfunctions of certain operators. The eigenvalues of these uh, functions um, are uh, the data, and L functions are a very convenient way to package them in a compact form. Um, so maybe to motivate uh, what one's trying to do, may, may, let me use an analogy from physics. Uh, one of the great discoveries of 19th century physics was that of absorption spectra uh, in the light that came from stars. Uh, if you pass starlight for, through a prism, breaking it up into its different wavelengths, you find, I've never done it, but I've read about it in books, and you find certain discrete black lines where the light of a given spectrum, namely corresponding to the black line, is not there. Now, I guess physicists didn't really understand why this was so, but what they did notice very quickly, what the, these missing spectra in the starlight that they observed um, was actually the same wavelengths 
um, as uh, spectra that came from different elements, in exper emitted, in fact, by different elements uh, in experiments here on Earth. And it wasn't too much of a uh, stat to conjecture or say, really just say, that the chemistry based on our familiar elements uh, here on Earth uh, was, in fact, similar, the same as that in uh, other parts of the universe. Um, added to that was they also observed that if you looked at the spectra of light from different galaxies, you, they found a red shift in these absorption spectra, uh, which led them to conclude that other galaxies were moving away from our galaxy at an enormous speed. And it wasn't too much of a step from that to uh, observe, uh, or at least conjecture, that if you look back in time, that perhaps it all began with some great explosion. So uh, truly, spectra, in this case, tells us about other worlds. The actual mechanism for why these lines existed, um, that had to wait until quantum mechanics, where um, uh, light uh, uh, photons uh, basically uh, had certain discrete wavelengths. And that's a subject that probably many of you know is based, uh, at least at its basic level, is, is based on uh, solutions of Schrodinger's equation and uh, a, a differential equation that basically whose main component is the Laplacian. Um, and so it's that uh, which um, is the analogy for automorphic forms. Uh, they also tell us about other worlds, but these are the, uh, not to be too poetic about it, but these are the internal worlds of number theory and arithmetic rather than external worlds. And, um, but they, uh, the spectra, they tell us, uh, they give us spectra that tell us about these worlds according to the Langlands program. Um, but uh, the spectra um, come from, not from starlight, but from differential equations, differential operators that are very much like the Schrodinger opera operator. So here is a picture which I got from the internet. Uh, the, uh, the top two bars represent um, absorption spectrum. That's the top one is what they would see uh, from starlight broken through a prism. The next one is what they observed from experiments that they would do with hydrogen. These are the characteristic lines of the element hydrogen. And the bottom one is the absorption spectrum red shifted with the Doppler effect. You can see the black lines are moved to the right in the bottom one. Uh, this is, we're talking wavelengths, not frequencies here. And uh, they're, they're moved, they're displaced to the right um, uh, from the black lines in the top one. So um, uh, the, the, uh, in, the automorphic forms come from differential operators. The spectra come from differential operators that are philosophically very similar to the Schrodinger operator, except they are given, they don't have any potential. If you're familiar with such things, they're purely kinetic, and they come, but they come from Laplace operators that are given by geometry, basically by uh, Riemannian, these very specific Riemannian manifolds. But before I try to describe that, let me uh, look at the arithmetic world and uh, sort of a fundamental problem that uh, has uh, been a part of investigations in number theory for centuries. So this is arithmetic L functions. These were um, defined by Michael Arton, uh, but let me first, uh, put forward for uh, this, uh, a very elementary uh, problem that requires no uh, fancy, uh, no advanced mathematics. Suppose that you have a polynomial um, with integral coefficients and um, uh, then for every prime number, um, one at a time, you don't do all prime numbers simultaneously, but one at a time please, you take a prime number and then you can factor this polynomial into irreducible factors mod p. Um, now it's customary uh, in this problem and in all of number theory to throw away uh, a finite set of primes where things aren't quite as nice as they should be. In this case that represents the set of prime numbers p such that these irreducible factors have higher multiplicity. 
Uh, those are called the ramified, I recall it. Those are called the ramified primes. So just because that creates a little bit of ambiguity in this problem, let's throw those away. And then uh, the remaining prime numbers, P, give you a set of distinct uh, irre irreducible mod P factors of this polynomial. Um, what's interesting is the degrees of these polynomials and how they depend on the prime number P. What you're getting is, uh, by letting P vary, you're getting a map from prime numbers, or almost all prime numbers, to these degrees, which represent a partition of n, a set of positive integers that add up to n. So you got a map from primes to partitions, uh, which I'm writing as pi p, partitions of n. It's something that one could do easily. Uh, anybody that uh, knows, uh, which I guess in Korea probably is done in grade five, I, I, I suspect, uh, about mod p arithmetic, anybody could um, play with this for a given polynomial and um, see what sort of uh, partitions one gets. The problem is uh, to try to characterize um, what partitions you get as p varies. For any fixed partition pi of n, find an independent description of its pre-image. What are the set of prime numbers p which, whose irreducible factors uh, give uh, these um, um, numbers ni which make up the given partition pi? Now this, I think, I think everyone might admit that this is an attractive problem, but perhaps not one that is at the center of mathematics. Um, but in fact, this problem, I, I think it would be fair to say, m many people would say that it's, it is the fundamental problem of uh, algebraic number theory. And why is that? Um, I'm going to backtrack just for a minute. We've, we've taken a polynomial with integral coefficients. Um, there's something else that we all know about such polynomials. You can um, factor them, maybe not explicitly, but you can look at the splitting field of such a polynomial, the field ex extension of Q, which contains all of the roots of that polynomial, um, and that is a Galois extension. In fact, that's essentially the definition of a Galois extension. So the field E, the splitting field of this polynomial, that's lurking uh, behind uh, this. And so now why is this a fundamental problem, this one here? Um, the set of prime numbers, um, in particular, what's particularly relevant, if you took the partition consisting entirely of ones. And those, that partition, the primes that give that partition, are called the primes that split completely in E or you could say the, pl the primes uh, that split completely for f. Um, it's easy to see that uh, that set of prime numbers, the set of prime numbers whose irreducible factors of the given polynomial are all linear, that that set of prime numbers um, is, d depends only on the field E. There's many polynomials that will give rise to a given splitting field, um, but the set of prime numbers um, that's for whose factors split that split completely depend only on the on the field and not the equate not the polynomial. Um, more to the point, um, the mapping from primes uh, from Galois extensions E over Q to subsets of primes, a set of primes for which uh, the uh, poly uh, uh, polynomial that, uh, whose splitting field is E split completely, but that mapping is actually injective. This set of primes is, this, it characterizes the Galois extension E. The first thing I mentioned is, is one of the, uh, the, the one that, that depends on only, only on E and not the, poly, not the equation F. That's one of the first uh, things that one observes in algebraic number theory. The second fact, the fact that in fact it characterizes E, that's a deeper theorem but not uh, very well known. Um, um, and, and so what you have, sitting right just in rational prime numbers, you have kind of a signature of any Galois extension. 
namely the set of primes for which a given such polynomial splits completely. And so the problem that I mentioned is, uh, includes uh, being able uh, to characterize the image of this map. You have an injective map from Galois extensions to subsets of primes, and we're asking um, uh, whether you, uh, to, if you can characterize its image, that would serve as a, a very elegant classification of Galois extensions of the rational numbers. So I recall this very simple example, uh, f of x equals x squared plus one. Um, uh, the splitting field E is the field, is the Gaussian field obtained by adjoining the square root of minus one to Q. Uh, the ramified primes one sees uh, consist only of the prime two. The remaining primes are odd and they would split into two families, the ones that are congruent to one mod four and congruent to three mod four and uh, the, one, the, the primes uh, corresponding to the partition one, one, that's what that's supposed to be. One, one is a partition of two. Uh, those are the ones that are congruent to one mod four and the primes that two there correspond, is supposed to be the partition consisting only of two. Now those are the ones that are congruent to three mod four. And so the primes that are congruent to one mod four are the signature, so to speak, in this uh, would-be classification of number fields. That's the signature of the Gaussian field. This was proved by Gauss. Uh, basically, his law, a part of his law of quadratic reciprocity, and uh, this this law, in fact, of Gauss. Uh, Gauss is. It's said that this was the theorem that Gauss proved that he was m most proud of. Um, it, it, what the, this theorem does is it gives you similar laws for any quadratic polynomial f of x or any quadratic extension of q. But Gauss um, did not find, I, I think he probably would have liked to find, he did not find analogs of these beautiful rules for higher uh, extensions. Um, there were some, there are, there are some results, but a complete answer is I, I think even for cubic extensions, well there is, uh, I think cubic extensions is, is perhaps okay, um, but um, certainly when you get up to fifth degree extensions, especially when the Galois group is not solvable, uh, this remained an open problem uh, for uh, over two centuries. So it's this problem uh, at which the automorphic forms are addressed. All right, um, so now we've got these data. We've got these, um, um, these data attached to prime numbers um, for any Galois extension, and we do what we always do. Um, a, a very convenient way to uh, package data is to embed it in the general linear group of n by n matrices. And in this case, that amounts to taking a representation of the Galois group the Galois group of E over Q, a presumably an arbitrary finite group, um, into uh, the group of n by n invertible complex matrices, group under multiplication. That way they all get displayed as uh, the group, elements of the group get displayed as matrices. And also let's assume for simplicity that um, um, this looks ominous. Are we, in <laughs> Are we in trouble here? Maybe it'll go away if I... Okay, good, it went away. Um, so let me assume for simplicity that we're in the sort of generic case where the Galois group is the symmetric group, the full symmetric group on n letters. Then partitions of n amount to conjugacy classes in the symmetric group. And given a representation of the Galois group, we then can map these conjugacy classes in the symmetric group. That corresponds to the cycle decomposition of anything in the symmetric group. We can map them into conjugacy classes in the general linear group semi-simple conjugacy classes, so that basically amounts to diagonal elements uh, in the group of complex n by n invertible matrices. So you've got, con you've got conjugacy classes in a general linear group. How do we deal with those? How do we uh, package them? Well, we take their characteristic polynomial. And that's what Artin, Emile Artin did uh, in the earlier parts of the 20th century. He, he simply, for every one of these prime numbers, he took the uh, characteristic polynomial, but 
I guess maybe motivated by Riemann and the definition of the Riemann zeta function, he didn't take it at a variable s, a variable x, but rather variable p to the minus s. But for any given p, the right-hand side is essentially the characteristic polynomial of this conjugacy class uh, inverted. And Artin then took the product of all of these things. Again, that's was, those, such products were introduced by Euler many, many long time ago. And uh, this uh, is now called an L function, an Artin L function. And um, uh, this uh, not only is a very convenient way for packaging the data, the conjugacy classes uh, attached to prime numbers that I have mentioned, but it also suggests, uh, um, in analogy with the Riemann zeta function, that um, the zeros of this function might uh, have a lot to say about the distribution of the, these conjugacy classes. Artin, by the way, conjectured that this uh, L function had analytic continuation and satisfied a functional equation that relates its values at s and 1 minus s, um, like the Riemann zeta function does. Uh, he also conjectured that this function was actually entire, had no poles, except in the very simple case that this is essentially a Riemann zeta function, say a one-dimensional rep trivial representation of the Galois group. Um, and uh, people also believe that all of its zeros, except for certain trivial zeros, lie on the line real part of s equals a half. So these are, this is a big, uh, this is a big thing, and it's all kinds of stuff that eludes us still. But anyway, that is the, uh, that's the arithmetic problem. I mean, I, I, there are other, uh, it's not the only one. Um, uh, the splitting field of a polynomial uh, of degree n is a very special case of uh, a motive, which I think was certainly mentioned in number theory talks prominently yesterday, perhaps in the other talks, um, which plays a simil similarly kind of uh, role in classification of algebraic varieties projective algebraic varieties, let's say, defined over the rational numbers, and there are L functions attached to those, and one could, again, try to uh, figure out, is there some way to characterize the data that goes into those things that might lead to a kind of classification of such objects? Okay, but anyway, that's the problem that we uh, uh, are thinking about then. And so I'm supposed to tell you um, how uh, automorphic forms is, we hope, represents a kind of solution of that problem. I think it, uh, I was, I dithered on this slide and therefore it's uh, angry with me. Uh, I will, I will uh, talk while, <laughs> while this is going on. So, um, so now I have, um, uh, <laughs> um, question. oh, it's working now? All right, all right, thank you. Um, is it? Yes, yes it is, yes, indeed. Um, so remember, what I was thinking of are um, certain operators um, on attached to Riemannian manifolds. And uh, I'm going to, I, Okay, thanks. Um, I will take the liberty uh, of maybe trying again to add little references to physics, uh, at least insofar as my imperfect understanding of such things goes. Uh, you can ignore them if you wish, um, but um, let me say in this case, we're dealing then the operators of whose eigenvalues we're talking about. Actually, there's two, kind of op two kinds of operators. One of them comes from the Laplace operator, the so-called Laplace Beltrami operator on a Riemannian manifold. Uh, so these play the role of Hamiltonians in quantum mechanics. Um, but there's a second set of operators, and these ones, so the first operators would come from any Riemannian manifold, but if you're dealing with the so-called locally symmetric space, a very special kind of Riemannian manifold, there's a whole family of other operators, which uh, ominously um, are attached, are parametrized by prime numbers. So that's interesting. They're the so-called Hecke operators and uh, on L2 of X, and they commute with the Laplace operator. And if I understand what the physicists, physicists language, uh, these are often called uh, momentum observables. Uh, but we can just think of them as other sort of con 
God-given operators that commute with the Laplacian. And so all of these operators commute with each other so you can simultaneously diagonalize them. And you're going to get families of simultaneous eigenvalues. I'll write them as C delta and CP, P and unramified. So again, it's, uh, you have to throw away a finite set of primes, but that's not uh, relevant for this discussion. Um, and you get uh, a whole f infinite family of um, simultaneous eigenvalues. And then I, I think uh, analogy, they, they seem to be rather close to, uh, not, not specifically, it's just an analogy, but be, be, uh, they're rather close to fundamental particles, electrons, quarks, and, and so on. Okay, this is, I'm, I'm coming to the two or three slides that might be the most difficult in my talk, uh, not because the mathematics is difficult, but because I don't have quite enough time to explain it all in uh, detail. Um, X is a Riemannian manifold, um, and everything I've said is, is a good way to, uh, we, we can examine things from the way I've said, but actually, when you actually, the, the um, um, it's much easier or, or more convenient to work equivalently with groups. And so these Riemannian manifolds are attached to algebraic groups, reductive algebraic groups G over Q. So here we go with another whole big subject, algebraic groups. Um, I think a lot of people um, do just uh, take a book on algebraic groups and they memorize the 10 uh, main theorems and then they um, get some experience and intuition in dealing with them, at least at the beginning. So typically, so, so, so these, in any case, these objects are really attached. It's more convenient to um, work with the, an algebraic group, which gives rise to the Riemannian manifold, but we'll treat uh, the, uh, for a typical case, as, the, as again, the group GLN of n by n matrices. Now, so here's, this is, the, this is something I won't define in detail, but it's a refinement of what I have just said with HECA operators. Oh, by the way, I may have had, hmm. I think uh, maybe I did send, I, did. <laughs> I think what I've given you is, in fact, uh, doesn't have all my latest revisions. Um, um, pardon me? Uh, yes, I am. So what's going on there? I think that's not me, because uh, I, I wouldn't have these page numbers. I think I'm missing some slides. Um, all right, shall I order it to... Um, All right, here, what, what mode do I want? Um, well, I have a second controller. Let's see what happens here. So I think I'm in the wrong mode. Now, um, see, it skipped, uh, it skipped. Uh, slide. So, uh, so slide nine was an example of HECA, <laughs> uh, a concrete example of uh, Riemannian uh, <laughs> Laplacian and HECA operators. Oh, hey, good. Yeah, good. I want nine. Thank you. Did I? I must have. I must have pressed the wrong button. Whoops. Oh no, we're we're. We're off, it's going, it's doing the odd numbers. Anyway, I'm going to, uh, we'll leave it there, I can talk on that. Here's an example. There's an example of a Riemannian manifold. Uh, this was talked in great, much greater generality in Egal's talk yesterday, I, I think. Um, it's uh, the, I'm taking X to be the upper half plane, um, modulo, okay, good. Okay, that's it. Um, I think it's working. Um, so, so here's an example. Take the upper half plane, um, 
That's a complex manifold, Riemannian manifold. It has a natural metric, the hyperbolic uh, metric. It's hyperbolic one space, uh, hyperbolic plane, excuse me. Um, it has a Laplace Beltrami operator, delta, which we can see there. But there um, is also a whole family of supplementary operators. Um, oh, I think I've lost my mic. <laughs> can you hear me? Okay, okay, we're all right, we're all right. Um, there's a... Unfortunately, we didn't activate this one. Can, can we activate this microphone? Hello? Hello? Can we activate? Okay, good. This, uh, LN, this one isn't active. Hello? Good, good. Take both? Okay, does this work? You okay? Um, so, uh, okay, good. Um, there is, uh, uh, so, so this space, H modulo gamma, um, is, comes with some extra operators. Um, the Laplacian basically comes from right translation, but um, you can also left translate um, by some matrices in SL2. Um, you wouldn't think you could do that because you would um, destroy the um, left invariance by SL2Z, but you can um, if you uh, then average it over a finite set of cosets. And uh, if you take TP to be the matrix P comma 1, then in fact you get an operator, the HECA operator. In this very particular case, you get the HECA operator attached uh, to the prime number P. Okay, so this is what I had tar started to talk about. Um, it actually, there's a little more structure to it in the general case than what I have indicated. Um, it turns out that, um, say in the case that the group is GLN, there are actually um, N different HECA operators, all of which commute with the Laplacian, and there are also N different uh, Laplace-like uh, operators. Uh, the Laplace operators are the bi-invariant differential operators on the real group, GLNR. Um, one shows that that's their n different operators and they generate an algebra. Uh, the HECA operators, if we're dealing with GLN now, you can take matrices with a 1P in the diagonal, 2Ps, 3Ps, and so on, up to NPs, and there's n of those as well. And uh, both of these uh, two uh, sets of um, operators give an algebra, which one can show is, uh, in both cases, isomorphic to the algebra of symmetric polynomials uh, in n variables. Specifically, uh, the, n, um, um, the uh, n variables in the diagonal matrices in the group GLNC. Um, G hat uh, is, uh, this is an example of one of the things that Langlands introduced in his paper, associating a dual group uh, to any group G, and in the case of GLN, the dual group is just GLNC, the complex uh, group. Um, I might say, uh, just as motivation for this, the dual group that Langlands introduces is really a fundamental part of all of this, and um, it's supposed to cl help classify representations, but let's just think, uh, so we're, if, supposing we're dealing with the uh, real vector space, a real n-dimensional vector space as an additive group. Um, if we are interested in its irreducible representations, their uh, e to the, the, um, rep the uh, e to the i n, e to the i x lambda, where lambda varies over all complex numbers. So the irreducible representations are all one-dimensional in that case, and uh, they are parametrized by the dual vector space, but it's complex points, not just the real points. And that's what's kind of going on here in a much more um, sophisticated situation. Um, all right. Um, um, okay, so then um, these, you've got n different, uh, um, 
uh, Hecke operators for every prime. You've got n different differential operators delta. And you can, they all commute with each other and you can simultaneously diagonalize all of those. And so what you end up getting um, are um, um, matching unordered n tuples of complex numbers parametrized by delta and the set of all prime numbers. Uh, well, this is a, these, these amount to uh, semi-simple conjugacy classes, um, which I'm writing as uh, write C delta of pi and C p of pi in the group G hat, G L N C. After all, if we're dealing with the algebra of symmetric polynomials in n variables, the characters of that algebra basically come from evaluating such polynomials at n points, not in which you don't care about the order. Another, well, that's what we're doing. We're taking um, conjugacy classes in uh, GLNC, does say diagonal matrices, um, but where you don't care about the order. Each such thing gives a character on the uh, algebra of symmetric functions and n variables, and that's, that's basically what's going on um, for these objects. And uh, then I'm using pi as an index for uh, families. Um, um, consisting of matching uh, unordered n tuples uh, attached to prime numbers and C delta. So every one of these families consists of an infinite number um, of diagonal matrices um, in which you do not care about the order and they are parameterized by prime numbers and by uh, uh, differential operators delta. So as I say, this is, by, so by the way, uh, this, this, this is kind of like, an analogy from physics, this is kind of like, uh, if I understand it, uh, composite particles, um, and G hat is kind of like the, the gauge group from physics. Um, um, in any case, this, this, these two slides, I mean, didn't help that I had to, uh, <laughs> Uh, there were also some other things, but th these were these are the most difficult part of the lecture because they basically involve a number of things that um, um, are not hard but take some time to define. So if you're with me, these are the data that come in a natural way from automorphic representations. Okay, I've used pi to index them, families of semi-simple conjugacy classes. I'm parametrizing them by pi, and I'm doing that deliberately. Pi actually um, is uh, the symbol that's universally used for an automorphic representation. And again, I, I'm not going to say specifically what that is, but it is an irreducible uh, constituent. Um, it's an irreducible representation of a locally compact group uh, GA, uh, the group of adelic points of my a given group G. So I, this, all of this can be done for any reductive group. Um, we're dealing with GLN, um, and it's, um, uh, this group GA is a locally compact group, and it has the uh, subgroup of integral, po of rational points. It's a discrete subgroup. One can take uh, the quotient, one can take L2 functions, L2 functions on it, and um, uh, we're looking at uh, an automorphic representation is an irreducible representation that occurs in the decomposition of this representation on L2 of GQ um, into GA um, given by right translation by GA. So um, I'm not saying exactly, I'm not making these terms really precise, but um, the important thing is that data in an automorphic representation gives rise to very concrete objects, eigenvalues of operators delta and TP. So that's very promising. I mean, this is rather similar to what we had uh, in the case of this problem from number theory. Um, and in particular, uh, Langlands, um, perhaps not a surprise at this point, Langlands copied, I mean, well, copied, not the right word, but we can copy what Artem did uh, to package this data, but this is data obtained in an entirely different way in turn, in, obtained by spectral theory, analytically, and we can copy this uh, by uh, simply introducing an L function defined in the same fashion as a, as a product of characteristic polynomials taken over prime numbers. So it's a Dirichlet series if you multiply it out, 
and uh, it converges in some right half plane. What makes it, so, so the analogy with R and L functions is, is clear, uh, but what, um, excuse me, what makes it particularly interesting in this situation is that uh, you can prove, um, it was done by Jacquet and Godemont, Godemont Jacquet, you can prove that these L functions do have analytic continuation uh, in the variable S to meromorphic functions which are almost always entire uh, with functional equation that relates their values at S and 1 minus s. You know, we can't prove the Riemann hypothesis for these, but apart from that, you prove everything, you can prove everything that you couldn't prove for Artenel functions. So, um, this is good, this is very good. Um, and then you can sort of imagine the conjecture, which Langlands made again in this article. Every arithmetic L function of the kind I defined at the beginning um, is an automorphic L function of the kind that I just wrote down. Um, more precisely, for every um, automorphic representation pi of GLN, uh, for, for every, uh, re excuse me, for every, f say, polynomial, splitting field E, and representation R of the Galois group of that into GLN, uh, there's an automorphic representation of GLN whose corresponding data are such that the two L functions are equal. In particular, the CP, the, the family of conju the, the, the conjugacy class, uh, the n conjugacy class is attached to a prime P and uh, a representation R of the Galois group uh, is equal to the, its analog for GL for the automorphic representation and the set of primes that split completely um, are the ones for which the spectral uh, conjugacy class is equal to one. So that represents a solution of the arithmetic problem um, in spectral terms, uh, a solution that comes from analysis. This is a, a it represents, um, a, a, it really represents something, um, it, it represents what uh, people have called non-abelian class field theory, a classification of number fields. Um, and it's also a special case of an even broader conjecture that Langlands posed, which has become known as the principle of functoriality. All right, so um, um, I'm going to just say a few words about the broader, uh, what Langlands did in this article. Um, um, what I've said is, is a special case, which I hope gives some idea of how the two kinds of uh, uh, data are related and why they're interesting and important but let me just say what the general ideas were in this article. In this article, this short article, it's uh, almost 50 years old, uh, Langlands did the following. First of all, he treated automorphic representations pi for any reductive algebraic group over uh, any number field F. Secondly, he introduced a complex dual group, G hat of G, uh, for the given group G, which typically is not, unlike GLN, is not the same group. It's a different group obtained actually by uh, taking the dual Dinkin, coxeter dinkin diagram uh, of the group G. Uh, and more generally, actually, the theory of algebraic groups suggests that you actually need something a little bit bigger, uh, a semi-direct product of this complex connected group G hat with a finite Galois group uh, for a sufficiently large Galois extension E over F. So I'm going to assume for simplicity that F is Q and that G is split, and then I can assume that E, the Galois extension, is actually just Q, and that GL is just G hat, as we did for GLN above. Three, Langlands, as we did for GLN, defined a mapping from automorphic representations pi to families uh, C of pi, uh, consisting of uh, semi-simple conjugacy classes um, that are parametrized by uh, simultaneous eigenvalues of HECA operators, TP for G. So I'm not saying precisely what that is, but you can imagine what they are. And in any case, I think you would agree that they're very concrete kinds of objects. They're basically, they're numbers. Uh, four, for any pi and any finite dimensional representation R uh, of the uh, dual group G hat, just like we did for Artenel functions, Langlands introduced a general automorphic L function by basically taking the conjugacy classes C, P, pi in the group G hat and then taking their image R in GLN. Uh, so 
objects for which you can take the characteristic polynomial and then taking the product. And then Langlands posed the following absolutely fundamental conjecture which eludes us in most, the most important cases to this day. It became known as the principle of functoriality and it says the following. Given, given two groups G and D prime, together with an onomorphic representation pi prime of G prime and an analytic uh, homomorphism between their dual groups, um, that there is a, an automorphic representation pi of G such that the family of conjugacy classes in G hat, C pi, is the image of the corresponding family, uh, image under rho of the corresponding family for G prime. In other words, CP of pi is rho of CP pi prime as conjugacy classes in G hat. Now I, I got a little rattled uh, with the uh, technical issues we had here so I forgot to mention something. What's interesting about these data is not so much that you have conjugacy classes in uh, diagonal matrices in GLN attached to prime numbers. Anybody can do that. You can just sort of calculate, you can sort of imagine calculating them. What's really interesting about them is not the actual conjugacy classes they themselves for a given prime number but how they relate one to another as the primes vary. That's what, the, those implicit relations are what really make onomorphic representations deep, that bind these things together in ways that govern fundamental properties of the, of nature in the, in the form of arithmetic phenomena. And that's what we're saying here. If you have a family for G prime uh, with conjugacy, uh, attached to conjugacy classes that come from an automorphic representation, you take its image as a family for G, uh, there's no guarantee that that would also have deep uh, relations among themselves that uh, come in from G. This is what functoriality says is the case, that whatever relations bind the, them for G prime, there's a similar family of relations that bind them for G. And often these present themselves as two entirely different uh, phenomena, um, different complete recipro uh, two entirely different um, sets of interesting relations. This, uh, this by the way would be trivial if you were working with Art and L functions. So this kind of thing if you just uh, sort of phrased it in terms of Art and L functions looks trivial, it is trivial and I think I, I speculate that maybe uh, that's what maybe people for f didn't really get why functoriality was interesting. But we've seen that representing these things in analytic terms is an entirely different kind of um, phenomenon. For example, you get analytic continuation and functional equation, something you can't touch with, uh, uh, of the kind that you can't touch for art and L functions. And um, so, so this, this, this is the fundamental problem, I, I would say, uh, in the Langlands program. All right, uh, I'll just add that uh, Langlands, uh, very quickly, uh, Langlands uh, did uh, uh, quite remarkably a number of, sketched a number of fundamental consequences of functoriality. He didn't prove it, he stated it as a conjecture, but then he sketched proofs of these. Analytic continuation and functional equation of these broader L functions. Uh, these, by the way, uh, are supposed to contain ever, any L function that's ever been defined at least that's of int defined by an Euler product and is, is of in interest in, say, ar the arithmetic world. Non-abelian class field theory, that's actually what I've already said. Namely, every art and L function is an automorphic L function. What else? Uh, he sketched a proof of what is known as the generalized Ramanujan conjecture. Uh, if G uh, is GLN and pi is a cuspidal automorphic representation of G, and the conjugacy classes uh, C, P, pi. Now they're not just conjugacy classes in G, L, N, C, but they actually correspond to conjugacy classes. They intersect the unitary group, uh, which turns out to be uh, very important. He also, well, he really just alluded to it, but he suggested that functoriality would give you a proof of the a great generalization of the Sato-Tate conjecture. Which, I, uh, which is, concerns the distribution of these conjugacy classes in unitary groups, which I observe was proved uh, quite recently just for the group GL2. Uh, it was a breakthrough and for some specific pi um, by Richard Taylor and 
uh, also uh, with uh, collaborators. And I note that three and four depend implicitly on automorphic L functions. All right, I've managed my time not terribly well. I've got come to the final third. Yes, I, I, I notice, I, I notice that uh, the, uh, the timing is, is getting short. I've got uh, just a few minutes. Uh, so the, uh, what I'm going to say very briefly concerns a classification of representations for classical groups G. So uh, simple uh, uh, Lie algebras, simple, uh, simply connected complex uh, Lie groups um, are both parametrized by, I guess the parametrization goes back a long time, um, and they're parametrized by diagrams, which I won't describe, I don't, wasn't planning anyway to describe in any detail. There's four infinite families corresponding to these four families of classical groups, and there are five isolated exceptional groups. So I'm talking about, I've talked about uh, general linear groups, and now I'm talking about the other th th three infinite families of groups. They include two cases of functoriality. Uh, the dual group, uh, I've, I've written down what the dual groups of these uh, other classical groups are, and you can see in the case of BN and CN that they uh, actually, the dual groups aren't the same as the original groups, but um, um, uh, whatever is the case, each of these dual groups has a natural embedding into a general linear group, so that's an example of, the, the dual group of a general linear group, that's an example of functoriality. There's another one gotten by taking the product of two uh, classical dual groups of the same kind into uh, uh, a classical dual group of uh, larger rank. These are two sort of natural cases of functoriality that are easy, look easy by comparison with the general case, but have not, had not been solved. Um, and now let me just say as a fact, the automorphic representations of uh, groups GLN, the groups of type AN, are pretty well understood thanks to the work of a lot of people, Harris, Enyar, Taylor, Jacquet, Pietetsky, Shapiro, Muglin, and Walsberger. And the problem is to classify represent automorphic representations of these other three infinite families in terms of those of GLN. Okay, so the main theorem in that book that I mentioned is A, case one of functoriality is valid. It leads to a mapping pi to pi n from automorphic representations of G to automorphic representations of GLN. B, case B, case two of functoriality is also valid. It leads to an explicit description of the image and fibers of this mapping in terms of what are known as local packets of representations, global packets of representations, and multiplicity formulas for a representation in a global packet as it occurs in the discrete spectrum of L2 GA over GQ. So in short, uh, really it is a classification of representations of these three other families, infinite families of classical split, I'm talking about split groups, split classical groups in terms of those of GLM. Okay, so this is a, a, a very long and complex argument based on the trace formula for G which I won't describe in any detail. A trace formula can sort of be regarded as a, a geometric expansion uh, being equal to a spectral, a spectral expansion. And if one uh, wants to be whimsical, one could say the geometric expansion is really closely related. Looks like something you'd get out of classical mechanics and the spectral expansion looks like something that you would get from its uh, uh, quantization. Uh, and the proof then is to consider uh, a comparison of the trace formulas for G prime and G in the two cases of functoriality that we're dealing with. And uh, uh, this uses work of uh, other uh, people in a fundamental way. It uses results on endoscopy of Kotwitz, Langlands, and Shellstead. It uses the fundamental lemma uh, which uh, has a number of people have been invo involved in, notably Ngo and Walsberger. And I recall that Ngo was awarded a Fields Medal four years ago for his uh, uh, remarkable contribution to what remained of the fundamental lemma, which was really a very big piece and in which involved uh, uh, 
completely new methods that had never really been used in, in, the language, in automorphic representations before. And uh, intertwining operators, they're kind of like scattering matrices in physics. And there are some selected applications um, uh, of the, those theorems that I have just described. So I think I'm almost on time. Um, that is uh, the end of my lecture. Thanks very much, Jim. And I think we uh, even have time for a few questions for the speaker, if you'd like. Are there any questions? Yes, please. Split the primes mod one and mod four. If I want to create similar examples, say to split the primes uh, mod thirty. Uh, if, if it's a, the, 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 this splitting of this this uh, uh, the, the, this example, come, of course, you need a polynomial to start with, and if you uh, do the polynomial, if you take any quadratic polynomial, and um, uh, if you're, I don't know, you could, one could, if one's not even familiar with it, one can look up the law of quadratic reciprocity, and then I think one could uh, solve these things based on that law, and you're certainly going to get congruence conditions for other quadratic polynomials that involve 30 and, and, and other numbers as well. Unfortunately, my paper doesn't contain, I, I'm not an expert on the physics, I'd li I wish I were, but I'm not, so I didn't put in the physics analogies in my paper, I'm afraid. Other questions? Over there. How about the fractional polynomial? I beg your pardon? Fractional, fractional uh, polynomial. If the integer polynomial became the fractional, because of some fractional uh, partial differential equation, this kind of things involved, yeah. Yes, I, I, I really don't have any idea. The Langlands program doesn't uh, consider such things. Uh, if, uh, um, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, something uh, arose along those lines, but I have no idea, I'm afraid, myself. And uh, uh, um, uh, there's any number of problems, interesting problems that could be solved. So uh, if you would like to look at that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Any other questions? Well, if not, let's thank Jim again. <laughs>